Now let's prove this intuitive theorem that says that whenever we have a convergent sequence which converges to some limit L, then its sequence of averages would converge, would also converge, and it would converge to the same limit. So what do I mean by sequence of averages? So suppose that we have the sequence an, and then we define a new sequence in its own right, whose nth element would be the sum of all the elements of this original sequence from the first one up to the nth element, divided by n, and then this defines a sequence in its own right. And then we need to prove that the limit of this sequence, uh, which we can also write this limit in, in the following way with the summation symbol, is also L. So we need to prove that uh, whenever the sequence um, an converges to the limit L, then so does the sequence um, of its averages, and it converges to the same limit. Okay, so now let's prove it. Okay, so so in order to prove it by according to definition, what we need to do, we need to take this new sequence that we just defined, and we need to take its presumed limit. So we're actually going to prove that L is the limit of the sequence. And we need to show that this difference can be made as small as we please, right? That is basically provided that we go far enough, right? So it means that for every epsilon, I need to show that I can find initial number n of epsilon, such that for every n that is greater than n of epsilon, this difference would be smaller than epsilon, right? So I just said verbally what we already know. So let's see how we do it step by step. So basically, I would need to do some computations and evaluate this expression and actually show that it has to be small, and basically as small as I please. Okay, so now we can write this expression in the following way. So this is a very useful trick that uh, is very common in mathematics, and you should, uh, I mean, you should be familiar with that. So basically what I did is I just inserted this L into the sum Y, because this L is a constant, right? So if we were to ignore this 1 over N for a moment here, and we would compute this sum, then we would get the, by the linearity of the sum, we'd get the original sum, and minus n times this L, right, because it's constant. But then I divide by 1 over n, so the n is getting cancelled out, and I get the same expression. So it's very convenient. So we're now getting, um, we're making progress. Why? Because we know that at least far away within the sequence, since the sequence converges to the limit L, then this difference is going to get small, right? Basically as small as we please, provided that we go far enough. So let's continue this estimation. Now we're going to use the triangle inequality. So uh, basically what I did is just apply this triangle inequality here and wrote it in the following way. So uh, yeah, this is just the triangle inequality. And now uh, what we're going to use, so far it's just a basic estimate. We didn't say or didn't use in any way uh, the fact that uh, we know that the sequence um, an converges to the limit l. So now I use this um, dummy variable k to indicate uh, the elements of the sequence. So since we know that the sequence ak converges to the limit l, yeah, and by the way here, k is this dummy variable to indicate summation, right? Uh, so if we, if we go back, then since the sequence ak converges to l, then by the definition of, uh, definition of convergence, this means that for every epsilon, I can find uh, initial number n1 of epsilon, such that for every k greater than n1 of epsilon, uh, the, the distance between a, a k and its limit would be smaller than epsilon half. And we'll see why I want this to use this epsilon half. Okay, so let's continue. So now I can actually break the sum into two parts. Okay, so, uh, and also, yeah, sorry. I'm going to break the sum into two parts and also uh, let's make the observation that we are now considering only the values of n, which are greater than this n1 of epsilon, right? Then basically I can break this sum, uh, the original sum, into two parts, right? So the sum, first summation would go from 1 up to n1, and then the other part would go from n1 uh, plus 1 up to n, right? Uh, and why is it useful? Because I already have an estimation on this expression over here. Uh, because I know that every element in this summation, right, according to uh, the definition of n1, is going to be smaller than epsilon half. So at least this part is controllable, and I can make it as small as I please. Okay, so let's proceed. And also, uh, if we go back, so um, this sum, okay, uh, n1 is fixed, n1 of epsilon is fixed, and so I want to evaluate it. 
So now if I would look at the elements of this summation, right, I can basically look at the maximal element in that, in that sum. So, um, and this M depends on epsilon because, uh, and one depends on epsilon, right? Because essentially the smaller epsilon is, we would expect that N1 would have to grow. And then M of epsilon could have only more terms here, right? If N1 is growing, so M, M should, you know, uh, should be like increasing function as, as epsilon uh, uh, is getting smaller, should increase with the smaller epsilon is, then the bigger m epsilon uh, could be. It cannot decrease, right? If it gets, if you get more elements in this um, uh, expression, which we take the, the the maximum, right? If this set gets more elements, then the maximum can only grow, all right? So now let's go back. So then, using um, using this notation of m of m of epsilon and what we've had previously we can now estimate the sum. So the summation uh, of the first part, k goes from one up to n one of epsilon, one over n, and then the other part is the summation from n one of epsilon plus one uh, up to n. So every uh, every k here is greater than n one of epsilon. Therefore, uh, every term in the sum is going to be smaller than epsilon half. So now let's see uh, how to make the estimate. So here, since every element of this in this summation is smaller than m of epsilon, and their n1 summons here, then this expression is going to be smaller than the maximum of each summoned times the number of elements, and then we have this one over n. So, okay, the first part is going to be smaller than that. What about the second part? Well, regarding the second part, how many elements are we going to have? So we're going to have n minus this, right? n minus uh, n, one of epsilon minus one, right? This is the number of elements in, in this summation. And each element is smaller than epsilon half. And then we have this one over n here. All right, so we've managed to bound, bound this expression above by that, right? But our job is not done yet. And now I'm going to make another estimate here. So essentially what's important for me here is that here on top we have a number which is smaller than n and we divide it by n. So we're going to have something here, which is smaller than n, other uh, than one, sorry, right? On top, we have something smaller than n, and here on the bottom, we have n. So the, the quotient is going to be smaller than one, and as a result, this sum is going to be strictly smaller than epsilon half, right? So, uh, so the first part remains as it is, and then we have this epsilon half, all right? So we've made some progress. And essentially, if I would be able to make this um, expression as small as I please, smaller than epsilon half, then our job here would be done. But how do I make it as small as I please? Well, essentially, we're going to write this. Essentially, I can think of m of epsilon and n1 of epsilon as currently being fixed as this snapshot. But this n, right, uh, we can we can choose how big it can be, right? Essentially, we can make it as big as we please. So let's write this down. So we're thinking of n of one of epsilon and of epsilon uh, m of epsilon as being fixed, but n we can choose it as big as we please so far, right? And again, I mean this is not part of the official proof. But this is just for your conveni convenience. Uh, I elaborate like the steps of reasoning. How would we proceed? Uh, so of course we would like to choose n to be big enough such that this expression that we have here would be smaller than epsilon half, right? And then using this uh, inequality that we desire to achieve, we see that in order uh, for this to happen, this is essentially equivalent to demanding that, uh, that n would be bigger than this expression, right? Uh, because if n is bigger than that, then this expression is smaller than epsilon half. Okay, so now we actually know, right, uh, what to do, because now we're going to choose n of epsilon. This n of epsilon is going to be the n of epsilon for the sequence of averages. We're going to choose this to be the maximum between n1 of epsilon, which is a well-defined known number, and n1 is known, and m of epsilon is also known, and epsilon is known, so we can compute another number, which is this number, 
and then to choose n of epsilon as being the maximal number between the two. Okay? And then uh, for every n that is greater than this n of epsilon, we're basically going to have that both of the conditions that we want are holding. Basically, this is going to be smaller than epsilon half, and um, this sum is going to be smaller than epsilon half. So let's proceed. So now let's make a recap what we wanted to do. So essentially we wanted to show that the limit of the sequence of averages is the same as the limit of the original sequence, right? So we wanted to show that this can be made as small as we please, right? And so we've made some bounds above and estimates. So this is um, smaller or equal than, than this, uh, just breaking this sum into two, uh, into two parts and using triangle inequality. And then we've managed to bound above this part in the sum by this. And this, uh, since n is greater than n of epsilon, and n of epsilon is greater or equal to n1, then every sum in here is smaller than epsilon half. And therefore, all this sum, all this expression is smaller than epsilon half. And now also, since n is bigger than n of epsilon, and n of epsilon is bigger or equal to this expression, right? It means that this inequality is going to hold. So this uh, this expression over here is going to be smaller than epsilon half, right? And as a result, this is smaller than epsilon. And now we've showed, according to definition, that the sequence of averages converges to the same limit as the original sequence, right? Why? Because for every epsilon, I show that there exists n of epsilon, and I've showed you how to compute it, right? such that for every n greater than n of epsilon, this difference between this newly defined sequence of averages uh, and its limit is smaller than epsilon, which means, according to definition, that this sequence of averages converges to the limit L. So now that we have shown that whenever we have a convergent sequence, that then its sequence of averages has to converge to the same limit, we can ask the question whether the converse is true. If the sequence of averages converges, does this mean that uh, the original sequence converges? And the answer is no, but let's see something visual here. So there is a way to define a sequence in Desmos. This is how I define the sequence. Uh, and I just wanted to have a sequence with uh, non-zero mean, so to say, so it's going to have some positive bias. Therefore, I took a, uh, you know, a sine squared here. And so if we were to plot the sequence that I've chose, it's basically this sequence. And we can easily see that the sequence does not converge to any limit, right? Because it has essentially eight partial limits. Um, yeah, for it, it has uh, subsequences that converges to this value and a subsequence that converges to this value. So it has, so to say, eight partial limits, but this sequence does not converge to any limit. Nevertheless, we're going to see, we're going to show that its sequence of averages converges to the average of those eight elements that we see here. And so let's define L here as this value, which is the average of the first eight values of this sequence. Okay. And so we're going to show that this L is going to be the candidate for the limit. So this is essentially the average of, of this eight elements batch, but this is going to be essentially the average of the uh, the, the limit of the sequence of averages, okay? And so now, um, here we have defined the sequence of averages. And so let's now plot the sequence of averages. So the those dots that you're seeing here are the elements of the sequence of averages. And as you can see, it converges quite rapidly to the average of the orange sequence, which does not converge. So here we see an example of a, a sequence whose sequence of averages converges to a limit, uh, but the original sequence does not converge, right? So the converse statement wouldn't be true. Um, so here, if we'd like to see it according to the uh, definition of epsilon, so for every epsilon that we choose, um, the distance of the, those elements from the limit would be smaller than epsilon, provided that we go far enough, right? Now, basically, what I said but didn't prove is that this sequence, I showed it visually, that the sequence of averages does converge to this 
average limit, but I didn't prove it. So, and I'll leave it as an exercise, but basically I'm going to just describe the idea behind the proof. Uh, so, when you look at, uh, when you take a very large number of elements of the sequence, suppose that you take this huge multiple of eight number of elements. So, in a, each eight batch that you would separate it, you would have that the average would be just the average of those eight points because it basically repeats itself. And then since you've taken a huge number, like at the next step, this, uh, when you take this element, it doesn't shift the average by a lot. It's gonna be a very tiny shift. And this not, is not going to shift the average by a lot. And this doesn't, is not going to have a big effect. Up until the point where you get to this point that you've taken the batch of all those eights and then you get the same value for the average once again so i hope it was clear enough